Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, A Platform to Digitize Biology, a Potential Pathway to Exponential Medicine, presented by Dr. John McDevitt. We're excited to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots, the leading scientific social networking website and provider of virtual events and webinars advancing scientific collaboration and learning. For more information, please go to www.labroots.com. I'm Christina Jewell of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Just click on the green Q&A button located at the lower left of the presentation window and type your question into the box that appears on the screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. Also, please notice that you'll be viewing the presentation in the slide window. To enlarge the window, just click on the screen icon located in the lower right. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of the presentation window. Or you can use the Q&A button to let us know you're having a problem. This is an educational webinar and thus offers free continuing education credits. After the webinar is over, please click on the CE button located at the bottom left-hand corner of your webpage and follow the process of obtaining your credits. I would now like to introduce Dr. John McDevitt. Dr. McDevitt is a pioneer in the development of the program programmable bio-nanochip, PBNC sensor systems. These chip-based sensors have laid the foundation for the efficient collection of first-in-kind wellness and disease signatures for the areas of adjunctive oral cancer tests, as well as for cardiac wellness profiles. McDevitt has displayed a strong track record of translating essential bioscience discoveries into real-world clinical practice. He serves as a scientific founder and chief scientific officer for Sensidex. A, a diagnostic company committed to the development of affordable medical micro device technologies. Dr. McDevitt currently serves as the chair for the biomaterials department at New York University's College of Dentistry. McDevitt and his team have written more than 200 peer reviewed scientific manuscripts and have contributed to more than 100 patents and patent applications. In addition to the 2016 AACC Wallace H. Coulter Lectorship Award, this work was recognized with the Best of What's New Award in the medical device category by Popular Science, as well as for the Best Scientific Advances Award by the Science Coalition. Please join me in welcoming Dr. John McDevitt. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Dr. McDevitt? Christy, thank you so much for that kind introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. Pleasure to have an opportunity to speak with you today. Today's medical system is complex, expensive, and inefficient. It requires a huge infrastructure sophisticated equipment, complex sample handling, and tons and tons of paperwork. One size fits all. We need a better way forward, but this is the past. And today, we'll speak about the future. The programmable bio nano chip system is a platform to digitize biology using sensors that learn. For the first time, we'll be in a position to capture diseases early before they spiral out of control. Now, my presentation today will take us into a journey where we'll look at three specific areas. First, I'll introduce the core technology, the programmable bio nanochip system. Then we'll look at the training of this device. Again, this is a sensor that learns. And the curriculum, so to speak, that I'll talk about today relates to two clinical applications, one for oral cancer and the second for 
uh, a risk assessment related to cardiac heart disease. I'll end my talk with a brief discussion about how this science and engineering has a potential impact on the road to exponential medicine, and I'll, I'll define what I mean by that at that point. Okay, so let's jump in. So let's begin with the topic of convergence. There are five main areas that are co combined here for the first time to create these sensors that learn. These are point of care, microfluidics, biomarker discovery, artificial intelligence, and mobile health. The diagnostic industry, as we all know today, is poised for change. We need the iPhone of medicine, but how do we get there? Well, we begin with non-invasive sampling, and that allows us to do testing just about anywhere. And then we have a programmable lab card, and that's key for allowing us to bring in new content as needed from the omics discoveries, etc. Then we have a diagnostic node that puts us in a global setting, and then we bring into play algorithms and mobile health tools which together allow us to take complex biomarker information and reduce it to a, an intuitive single number index that goes directly to the patient and the healthcare provider alike. Let's take a look underneath the hood of the instrumentation. There are two major parts that come together here, a lab card and an analyzer. The analyzer serves as a mechanical software and an optics interface. The lab card is inserted into the analyzer to complete the test and at the end of the process light emitting diodes flash and are used to create fluorescent images that allow us to digitize biology. So we have one platform with many clinical functions, and, and this is a lab card sized entity which has as its guts a chip region which allows us to create two different configurations. The one in the upper center is a membrane and that captures cells and the second one is a bead array that allows us to do soluble chemistries. So the key is, is that both of these configurations fit within that same lab card and interface with an analyzer ultimately replacing the functionality of all the different instruments that you see in this view graph. Let's take a closer look at both lab card configurations next, starting with the membrane-based system. Initially, a couple drops of fluid containing the cell suspension is introduced into the lab card. Capillary forces draw it into the interior. Then the right-hand blister drives the cell suspension to the top of the lab card where the cells are captured. Next, the left-hand blister forces fluid through a reagent pad redissolving a red, a green, and a blue reagent. The cells move through this process towards the top of the lab card where they are caught in one focal plane. The reagent cocktail comes in and stains the individual cells hitting the nucleus, the cytoplasm, and a variety of different surface markers. Using this process, high content single cell analysis is completed at the point of single cell analyses are 
created at the point of care. So, so ne next, let's take a look at the bead-based configuration. Next, let's take a look at the bead-based configuration of the lab card. The front end is basically the same, and it's not shown here. Rather, what we focus on is the magic of biomarker capture. The bead serves as a micro sponge with a nano net and is coated with a high concentration of a capture antibody in this case. The pentameric protein CRP is shown in this sequence being sequestered from the solution at this initial stage. We don't see it at that first stage and it's not until we bring in the detection antibody, this case coated with green fluorophores, that we're able to visualize the presence of this protein at the very end of the assay when the green light emitting diode flashes. So how did we get here? Well, this particular slide gives you a sense of the three major steps that we took. We began with basic science and engineering, the discovery aspects. This took a decade. And then we ran a series of clinical trials that I'll feature here in a second. And more recently, we've begun the process of scaling. So in the diagnostic industry, I think as everyone can imagine, there's, there's no shortcuts here. Uh, lives are at stake, and we need to be absolutely sure that we have good quality results. And so this is part of the rigor that we've taken to develop these devices. But I would say one of the good things about having done all this, and this is represented in these green arrows, is this uh, basically 15 years of activity is now behind us. And we're in a position where we can accelerate and move much more quickly for the next uh, stages. I'll come back to this point at the very end of the presentation when we talk about the pathway to exponential medicine. So. We, We've now run a series of, of different clinical trials uh, with a large number of patients for a number of different areas. Uh, six major trials, over 5,000 patients, uh, 10 clinical sites, many biomarkers, all using non-invasive sampling. And the purpose of this is to identify the appropriate uh, patient populations and bring in new content and new fingerprints that can capture diseases earlier on uh, than what has been done in the past. And, and that'll be a main theme of my talk today. So, so it starts with these clinical trials. So how does this system work? Well, it, it's much like a glucometer in that we have no pipetting step. We simply put a drop of a bodily fluid on a target zone, and then everything else happens within the lab card and within the associated instrument. And we've spent over 100 person years in engineering the capture of biomarkers. So it's now very efficient in this miniaturized format. And it gives us uh, results on the time course of a doctor's visit. Uh, more importantly, we're able to secure lab quality results at the point of care. So miniaturization doesn't cost us in terms of performance. Now throughout my talk, I, I will make reference to a, a couple peer review publications. And at the very end, I'll send a, a link out to, to all of our publications. But the, the first one deals with the core technology and is published in Lab on a Chip. So let's switch gears here a little bit now and, and move into the second area about the clinical training of this sensor that learns. And I want to focus your attention not on the plurality of, of chips, but more specifically to the oral cancer applications that's at the lower right-hand corner of this particular slide. The yellow chip, the oral cancer one, is where we'll go to next. Now, 
oral cancer is one of the most expensive of all the cancers to treat, and it also has one of the worst outcomes. And unfortunately for people getting oral cancer, uh, the outcomes have not increased much over the last five decades. Now the good news is when the disease is caught early, the outcomes are actually quite good. But we don't have an effective means to bring in and screen, or we don't have an effective adjunct test now to capture the disease early. So we needed to innovate, and we needed to put together a new type of study that has never been done previously in order to gather enough information so that we could look across all the different diagnostic categories. So with funding coming from a special program from the NIH, a grand opportunity program, we were able to create a one-of-a-kind trial that has the structure that I show you here. I won't go into the minutia, but rather focus on the key aspect here of getting over a thousand patients. And in doing so, this gave us the granularity to spread across all the different diagnostic categories, which is key for, for our next steps. So this brought us into the area of big data. And we were able to create one of the largest, if not the largest, database of cell-based uh, measurements ever created for potentially malignant oral lesions. So with these 1,000 patients, about 2,000 cells per patient, uh, we individually analyzed these cells, 13 million of them with over 150 image-based parameters, to create this huge database. And this allowed us to do data warehousing, data mining, and ultimately the predictive modeling that I'll feature in a second. So let me just put this uh, task into perspective and uh, give you a sense of, of what we needed to do in this particular trial. Now, if the task was to distinguish between normal or benign and malignant, uh, that would be very simple. And uh, in fact, if you look at the bottom of this view graph, you'll see the level of disagreement between the gold standard pathologists. So we had a number, uh, four different pathologists across our, our trial, and the level of disagreement is shown there. And one thing that's striking about this is in the middle, in the dysplasia reason, region, in the precancer, we see very significant disagreement. So let me focus your attention to panel B, where there are a, a number of numbers here. And there are seven different diagnostic categories that are mapped out, moving from normal to benign to three flavors of dysplasia, cancer in situ, and ultimately malignancy. Now, these different areas I'll come back to, and those numbers, in particular, what I want to focus your attention on is the 2-3 split. Uh, that's the benign mild split, and that's really where we want to capture these patients early on in the disease evolution process where the out outcomes for these patients are quite good. So with this gold standard, the pathologist and the um, H&E stain of a scalpel biopsy as being the means to make this diagnosis, we have a problem. The individual pathologist is what a patient would normally have access to, but we found that there was disagreement and we are training a new device and we wanted to have a higher level of certainty of where these patients were. So in this trial, we needed to innovate, and the innovation came with respect to how we adjudicated these samples, how we defined the truth. And it's been known for some time that if you crowdsource decisions, you actually make much better decisions than if you rely on one individual. And al although we were relying on the best pathologist in the world to make our diagnostic calls, that was not good enough. We needed to develop something even better than that 
And so what we created was an enhanced gold standard. And I won't go into the gory detail of this today, but rather to mention that there are four levels of adjudication. I'll give you a link to the paper so you can look into this more deeply in a, in a, um, after this presentation. But the key theme for this talk is that we started with a 69% agreement at the individual pathologist level. And after these four levels of judging, we went up to 100% agreement. So that's our starting point now in developing these diagnostic models. And again, this is published in Quad, Quad O uh, uh, last year. And that will serve as the basis for uh, the training of our algorithms. Now, with this adjudication process in hand, we're, we're now in a capacity to, to take the next step. And the next step for us was to acknowledge and recognize that we do business differently than the way the pathologists do their analysis of these patients' samples. So at the top of this view graph is shown the data the H&E stain on a glass slide for a tissue slice that a professional pathologist would look at. And you see benign and malignant, and a trained pathologist can eat this up and, and go and make this diagnosis. And again, this is the easy diagnosis, the, the two extremes. So with our chip, we needed to learn to speak a new language, and you see the, the vocabulary, if you like, at, at the bottom of this view graph, the individual cells that are stained with these three colors that were shown in, in that movie. And you see a benign patient uh, in the center, and then with more colorful display, the malignant patient uh, at the lower right. So one of the things that, that, that we then did, we had this big data uh, with these 13 mi million cells profiled with these 150 imaging parameters. And we had to ask ourselves, how do we make sense of this? So we used machine learning at the individual metric level first to see what was most important. And this is a multi-dimensional space, which is unbelievably complex. So I'm giving you just a little slice of, of the data. But this particular heat map gives you some key insights for where the information is being derived from. And we had some surprises here and some, some new biology that we uncovered with all this data. So at the, at the top of this view graph, let me focus your attention on the biomarkers and the different uh, diagnostic transitions. The most important one of which, again, is this 2-3 transition. And you look at the heat map, and immediately you recognize the best biomarker for making this decision, the one that's richest in information and shows up red hot is KI-67. Now, that was not known in the literature previously. Uh, but we got a clear indication that that's the case. We also found that nuclear cytoplasm ratio is good, but that tends to capture the disease late in the evolution. The other surprise from this is cell circularity, which wasn't a, a dominant variable, but it is, in fact, very hot, and it, it extends into these early transitions. So that's one view of the data. The other view of the data that I want to show you, and again, this is from the single biomarker perspective, is encoded in this color-encoded color chord diagram. And you probably don't stare at these chord diagrams every day, so let me help you understand how to navigate this. On the right-hand portion of this particular view graph, if you can see my mouse here, uh, with the gray uh, cord here are the different diagnostic transitions. And again, let me focus your attention on the 2-3, because that's the one that is clinically most important. And uh, that's on the right-hand side. On the left-hand side is where the information comes from. And again, this is color encoded, uh, the lesion characteristics, the, the color, the size, whether or not there's lichen planus, that's in, encoded in, in yellow. Then we have the nuclear 
parameters, then the molecular biomarkers, and the uh, morphometric details in red. So looking at the width of the cord, you get some information about where does the important information come from. And immediately what should strike you for this early transition is the biomarkers are a dominant part, but it's not just biomarkers. It's biomarkers and the other things. In fact, it's all of these categories that contribute to making a better decision. So what I just showed you was a view of where the information was coming from related to the individual biomarkers, but we don't have individual biomarkers. We have big computers. In fact, we have supercomputers that can chomp on all the different uh, metrics and put them together into multi-marker combinations. And so what, what uh, is pulled out now in this particular view graph is the areas underneath the receiver operator characteristic curves, which in essence is a measure of the diagnostic accuracy, the sensitivity, the specificity. Uh, a number of one sweeps out perfect uh, diagnosis on both of those metrics. Now, another unique thing about this trial is that we did both model development and model validation in the same trial. We had two sets of statisticians. This was run the way the pharmaceutical industry runs clinical trials, and we separated the model development from the model validation so that we could uh, do both, both of these steps in this particular trial. So the before represents model development, the after represents the picture that we get uh, uh, after we put the stake in the sand and, and, and selected the, the models. And one of the key metrics here is, is that the areas underneath the curve are actually quite good. They, they drop only about 4% in going from model development to model validation. The, uh, average in the literature, not the best, but the average in the literature for this validation step is a loss of 23%, going from an A to a C in terms of a grade. Uh, so, so we didn't have that happen. We, uh, it didn't overfit the data. Now, the other thing I, I want to mention is this two versus seven comparison. If we simplify the analysis and say we're going to look at benign versus cancer uh, and only pull out the patients with those two categories, we get a diagnostic accuracy very close to one. The area underneath the, clo the curve very, very close to one. And so that's really key because it shows that it's not adequate simply to look at these two extremes. And when we look at the adjunctive tests that are on the market today, which only cover about 2% of, of the patients that you'd like to have these uh, adjuncts and screens on, uh, we just don't get the confidence, we don't get the accuracy, we don't have the granularity yet. And it goes back to the fact that, that the way these devices were trained were at these two extremes. So, so we need to look at big data, we need to look at more data channels to get this level of accuracy. And this whole area of the oral cancer and development of this new adjunctive test has just been published recently, and we have a series of other articles following this, this up, but the August issue of Oral Oncology has, has our, our first discussion of the Grand Opportunity Trial. Okay, so, so now let me switch gears here a little bit to, to the area of cardiovascular disease. And, and this is the, the chip. Uh, again, it looks the same. It has a different color, but it has the same form factor. And what I'm doing now is I'm switching from a cell-based test, the oral cancer cell-based test, into a multiplexed protein test, which is done on a bead array. So cardiac heart disease is in many ways similar to the oral cancer application which I've just talked about in the sense that both of these uh, areas now focus on late stage disease diagnosis. 
and our goal in cardiac heart disease is actually very similar. We want to develop new tools that put a flashlight on the disease and allow us to look in the dark, dark so to, to speak, and help to take this very significant disease, which is the number one killer in the United States, and on a global basis and provide more effective feedback to patients and clinicians. So that was the basis for us moving into this particular area. And so we did a lot of the same things that I've just talked about. In fact, this particular trial overlapped in a time course with the uh, oral cancer program that I just uh, mentioned. This, this also was funded uh, through NIH. And it involved a, a study where we had a prospective recruitment of chest pain patients at uh, two hospitals, Bentawa and the uh, DeBakey VA Center in Houston. And we collaborated with the two clinicians here, Christy Valentin, who, who is a, a risk assessment doctor and also involved in metabolic syndrome, and uh, so to capture the disease early. And then Bikem Boskert is a heart failure doctor, uh, representing the other extreme. So we had four time points, uh, two bodily fluids, and 15 biomarkers. And this is really, really key, is, is having the uh, granularity with respect to time now and also with respect to biomarkers that uh, makes this, uh, this uh, effort unique. So if we look now at, at uh, what's happening in the cardiac diagnostic industry, uh, there's remote lab point of care and, and laboratory developed test. Uh, in the remote lab in the point of care, there's, there's 20 instruments that are approved by the FDA. Uh, the LDTs are, are, are not in this category. But 19 of 20 of these approved devices focus on making measurements of cardiac biomarkers one at a time. So we look at this area as uh, one in which there's a deficiency and one that we want to address uh, by developing new databases that can help to enrich multi-marker measurements. So one of the things that, that we did here initially, and this happened before we began this 1,000 uh, patient plus trial, is we selected biomarkers that span across the seven stages of the cardiovascular cascade, going from healthy to plaque formation, to uh, destabilize plaque, to, to rupture, to clot formation, to AMI, and heart failure. So today, these cardiac conditions are treated as syndromes. They're not all looked at simultaneously. But what we're doing in all our trials now is taking all the biomarkers that you see here and putting them into algorithms into the chip that gathers the information that we need and creating algorithms that are specific to where the patient is at. So this correlation matrix, which you see now, is looking at how the cross interactions go within these biomarkers. And while you see some correlations, let's say in, in the AMI sector here, there's a lot of blue regions which are not very hot, hot. And this gives us a sense that we get different information from these various biomarkers. And that is by design. So, and now the, the fingerprints will become key in a minute, and we'll get to that in a second, but, but let me first talk a, a little bit about uh, how the measurements are, are acquired uh, with, in this uh, particular lab card. So if you look at the top first, uh, you'll see a series of different types of patients extracted from this trial. And these are, are representative examples of what you see, uh, for example, with a heart attack patient, the AMI patient here. And you see a series of different beads. Myoglobin is lighting up strongly, then CKMB, and then a, a bit more lightly, because this is at lower concentration, but this is cardiac troponin I, the best, best of the biomarkers for AMI. 
Now compare that fingerprint and that disposition of what these same beats are doing with a non-case. So this is part of the 85% of false alarms that, that came, came in and you see the chip is pretty dark in this case. Now we had a lot of congestive heart failure patients too coming to the emergency room with chest pains, but in fact 24% versus 15% for the AMI, but we would be able to diagnose them with a different signature. NT pro BNP and myoglobin are strongly lit up. And then we had a decent number of renal failure patients and cardiorenal syndrome patients, and they light up with yet another part of the chip involving D-dimer and a huge signal for cystatin C. So the point here is all of these patients came in suspecting uh, a heart attack, but we have different cardiac indications and we have uh, severe coronary artery disease, which I'll also get back to in a second, that are represented in this patient population. So the other thing I want to mention, in addition to the fingerprint as to what type of patient, but also there is a, a capacity to pull out specifically the intensity of fluorescence. So this is a simple chip of troponin I featured at the center of the chip with many duplicate beads. We don't need this many to make a typical measurement, but it shows you this dose-dependent curve. And from the fluorescence intensity, what we're able to pull out uh, from the, uh, minim uh, the, the fluorescence in intensity signal is basically this dose curve. And this dose curve uh, is shown here with the calculated limit of detection of 20 picograms, which is on order with some of the best point of care uh, troponin instruments that are on the market today. So, uh, we, we also correlate well with large instruments. This is a Siemens dimension instrument going against the, uh, the miniaturized sensor system that I've just talked about. Okay, so that was mainly from the perspective of showing that we could do a good job from the analytical performance. And next I want, want to talk about the, the clinical signatures and the multi-marker models that we were in the process of developing. And in this particular area, I'll, I'll feature four of them here. The, the AMI, acute coronary sy syndrome, heart failure, and cardiac wellness. Now, this is taking data first from the AMI uh, population, and, and I'm providing you a correlation graph that looks at the cross interactions, so the, the twofold interactions be, between these different biomarkers, initially at the one hour. And so if you focus your attention on the diagonal, where, where my mouse is going and where this dotted line is, you'll see an intersection of troponin with troponin. And uh, this is leading to an area underneath the curve uh, of about 0.8. So this is uh, mapping out what the literature knows for troponin at, at one hour. Uh, it's not perfect. But with our uh, chip-based system, we find that we get improvements, which are actually substantial at the same time point by combining a couple biomarkers. Uh, we bring troponin with, with BMP, we, we do better at, at that. Uh, at three hours, you, you see the signal getting richer, again at the diagonal, and the same combination of two biomarkers is looking even more interesting. It's red hot. It, and, but we also see some other biomarkers coming in, into play, and the whole process becomes even more rich at six hours, and then also at 12 hours. And what, what's interesting about, about this is, is not only the point of, of making better, better diagnosis at, uh, through a combination of, of multiple biomarkers, uh, but also that there's new uh, biology that is showing itself uh, cardiac remodeling effects that, that we will describe in the literature off into the future. 
So what I've just described uh, with the cardiac area, the cardiac AMI area, the heart attack, it, I would just look at that as being the, the tip of the iceberg. And in fact, when we look and compare standard of care to, to what we do with the multi-marker approach, we see some improvement, but the improvement is about 1.5% uh, better going from 98 to 99.5%. But larger increases in uh, the information come from other areas. And, and so, so I want to mention a, a, a couple of them. And uh, although I would describe what we're doing now as just being at the initial stages, in wellness, we already see improvements relative to the Framingham risk score. So we have looked at Framingham across our, our uh, studies and then also compared with the cardiac scorecard. And again, looking at the areas underneath the curve, we get some increase in performance by combining some of the traditional risk factors with these biomarkers. And so this looks at the areas underneath the curve, receiver operator characteristic curve over here on the left-hand panel, our, our scorecard plus, which is a combination of the biomarkers and some risk factors outperforms Framingham and it outperforms the, the biomarkers by, by themselves. So this model here, the cardiac, what I would describe as the cardiac scorecard, uh, the wellness scorecard is also well calibrated. So as we go up in terms of the decile of risk as defined by Framingham um, and other uh, risk parameters for cardiac heart disease, we also see that scale uh, for the cardiac scorecard. Now we've developed a, a number of different algorithms and, and and the thing I want to focus on here is the fact that all of this is happening within the same lab card, right? So, so, that, so we've combined these different biomarkers and we create different algorithms depending on the setting. And what I'm showing you on this particular view graph is uh, the logistic regression beta coefficient which is basically giving us information about the level of importance for the different variables and how this contributes to the four models that I've spoken to already. So if you focus your attention first on the AMI model, uh, the blue triangle here, and look at troponin at, at the bottom, the uh, beta coefficient is three, and this is off-scale good. So I'm not going to say anything new to people familiar with cardiac diagnostics, that this is an unbelievably good biomarker, but it's borne out in the methodologies that we've chosen here to do this lasso uh, logistic regression uh, technique that, that penalizes each subsequent variable and we don't touch the data. Uh, it's a conservative way to, to do this, but it gives us a good sense of, of the fact that we can pull in additional information, a little bit from BNP and then IL-1 beta. Um, and then when we look at ACS, so a ACS being AMI and unstable angina, that diagnostic challenge is actually harder uh, troponin does less well, uh, we have more of a, of a reliance on BNP and the diabetes status uh, also plays a role. Then heart failure, uh, no surprise here, BNP is the dominant variable, troponin contributes to that, but BN, BNP is also part of that as well as age. The most important point though I want to make on this view graph though is what is happening with respect to the wellness model. This is the most complex of all these models. It has the most uh, rich data sources. It has many biomarkers contributing. And it has smoking and, and uh, gender is an important theme. But what's interesting here is BMI is a huge part of the information. And this, the BMA, BMI is not part of the Framingham, the original Framingham risk score. And so we, we, we find this as a key 
uh, a key observation and, and part of our algorithms. So our, our initial uh, papers in this area are going out to the machine learning. We have some uh, high-profile uh, clinical publications following the, this up, but, but expert systems with application is, is where you'll find this initial work. So let me next move to the, the last topic, and, and this is the area of the pathway uh, to exponential medicine. And this pathway to exponential medicine becomes possible by virtue of creating a diagnostic platform that digitizes biology. And in this area, if we want to go down the pathway to exponential medicine, you need to go down the pathway that information technology has gone in the past. So, so you need to follow the information. And it's not all about counting the number of calories or the number of steps on your cell phone. And that part is already done, but 70%, about 70% of clinical decision making is made with the aid of clinical tests. It's made with the biomarker measurements. So it's about information, and, and we need to uh, think about where does this come from. So uh, going back historically about accessing information, uh, the cavemen gathered information from, uh, by talking around a campfire. This information came from a local and linear perspective. It was a couple human beings communicating uh, with one another in this local environment. And we did a little bit better with the invention of the printing press. And I say a little bit better. Now, now we have an ability to distribute books across the, the planet, but if you have to print them out and mail them and have someone pay for, for that, there's a whole bunch of infrastructure that's in the way that makes this not a highly scalable uh, distribution channel. But things get insanely interesting at the next step. And the next step is when information flows in a digital sense. And now we can move information across the planet at the speed of light. And again, this all becomes possible because of a couple things, because of infrastructure that's scalable and also the capacity to digitize information and send it over a, an established network. So let's now consider the process of 30 steps. And I want to make a, a key point here. And we'll, in the next movie, we'll, we'll look into this issue. Thirty linear steps get you across the street. That is equivalent to about 30 meters. That's as far as you go. Thirty exponential steps yields a journey that traverses over one billion meters. Humans are hardwired to think locally and linearly. It's difficult for us to even imagine what the impact of an exponential technology could be. Each trip around our planet is about 40 million meters. Thus, our exponential journey provides us with the capacity to complete 26 and a half round trips across the globe. So, 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 so let me go back and, and basically narrate what you just saw. The, the point was 30 linear steps get you across the street. It's about 30 meters. 30 exponential steps takes you 2 to the 30th power, which is a bit over a billion. And human beings are, are hardwired to, to think locally and, and linearly. And it's hard for us to even imagine what that means. But, 
but it is the equivalent of us walking around the planet or traversing around the planet or taking a flight around the planet 26 and a half times. So this all becomes possible when we digitize biology. And so in the last year, we, we begin to, begun to think about what does this mean? What does this mean to us? And, and we have one diagnostic node that we know we can look at and make measurements for a thousand patients. So we can begin with a billion, to, to think about treating a billion people with a million devices. Now a million sounds like a big number until you consider today on our planet we have over seven billion mobile phones. And so these, uh, these uh, tools are, are, are moving in a highly scalable way into all corners of our planet. So, so the diagnostics now, uh, we have to consider the, the pathway to scalability here. And this is, uh, I would say, at the beginning of the exponential curve. And, and at the beginning of the exponential curve, that curve looks linearly. But, but we are on that trajectory now. And I'm showing you David versus Goliath here. So, so our programmable bio nano chip, uh, the blue device juxtaposed uh, to a commercial clinical analyzer. And as we s stand today, we occupy about 1% of the volume of this mature device. And that blue box cost about 5 to 10% of the larger scale analyzer. So we, we are now in the process of thinking about and building scalable devices and moving this technology into a number of different settings. And what I've just described to you today might be thought of as the internet of biomarkers. And this uh, tool that can look at many different biomarkers, both at the cell, the protein level, uh, general chemistry, um, antibody-based tests, so many different uh, types of tests now bringing information in a common format to where it can be used next. And we're now building bridges to the Internet of Things. And I mentioned one such bridge already, which is body mass index, which can be, come from that scale that you see at the top. So, so uh, both, the, both of these things are coming together in this effort. And I think the fusion of data becomes even more interesting as we go forward. So this particular pathway of exponential medicine is, is elaborated. Uh, in uh, an article that was published just a couple months ago in Accounts of Chemical Research, and, and you can take a piece, peek at that article if you like. So as I, I move to, to uh, close up my talk, I, I just want to um, mention a, a, a bit about uh, wh where we're going. Um, our, our goal is to move this technology past the publication and into the uh, real world, and we already have the um, the devices that you see here. Uh, these are now in uh, the bioscience research sector. Um, we've launched a, a new company called Sensodex, and Sensodex is uh, moving this uh, through um, a number of different. Uh, processes. So, so a, 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 as I now summarize uh, my talk and, 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 and closing up here uh, before we move on to the questions, I, I want to leave you with the, 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 the big message here that, that we've developed a platform to digitize biology. Uh, this is our attempt to create the iPhone of medicine, which is a bridge between key features of non-invasive sampling. We spent a, a decade in a number of programs, which I haven't talked so much about today, but to do small volume of blood sampling, brush biopsies, uh, salivary diagnostics, all coming together uh, in this flexible platform. So that's the front end. And then it's combined with a, a programmable lab card 
I've given you two examples today of a yellow chip and a blue chip that we have many more in the pipeline, which I haven't had a chance to talk about yet. We have a diagnostic node uh, that is uh, being scaled and, and miniaturized further than what I show you here. And then, then we are becoming proficient at building uh, what I might describe as the Netflix of medicine. And that is uh, building algorithms using machine learning and developing standard protocols for running trials on, on the end uh, patient populations, uh, prospective trials with a probe, uh, tech, probe uh, clinical trial strategy. And then, and then we have uh, mobile health tools. We, we already have an app on Apple's App Store that, that can take this all the way over to the, to the patient. So uh, with that, um, you'll see a poll moving in, in front of, of you. And uh, as we move into the uh, question and, and answer period, um, uh, you might uh, feel inclined to, to take a peek at that and fill that out. So let me turn the uh, uh, moderation back to Christy and then uh, We'll move into the question and answer period. I really appreciate your, your kind of attention and look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Dr. McDevitt, for that informative presentation. Okay, it's time for Q&A. Now, if you have a question you'd like to ask Dr. McDevitt, please do so now. Just click on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window, type your question in the box, and click the send button. We will answer as many questions as we have time for. Okay, let's get started. Our first question is, okay, Dr. McDevitt, this question is regarding the reagent. Is it a closed system or an open system, and what type of clinical samples can be used? Christy, th th thanks for that question, and thanks for the audience, too. Uh, OK, so, so the reagents are included in the, the lab card. and. I have one here, um, and, and so th this is credit card size. On the back of the lab card, uh, there's a microfluidic circuitry uh, that includes a couple of glass pads, glass fiber pads, into which we deposit uh, the, the reagents. So the reagents are, are uh, actually put into the lab card in a way that's uh, analogous to uh, the environment which exists in an immunochromatographic strip. So, so they are, are stabilized for room temperature storage in the solid state and uh, are, are reconstituted during a typical assay. So the, 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 the other part of this is the sample. And the sample is, depending on the type of, of test here, so if this was an oral cancer, test, there would be a cytology brush that would be used by the, uh, the dentist to, to brush the surface of the red or the white lesion. That would be then transitioned into a little test tube uh, that creates a cell suspension uh, with stabilizer. And then a little pipette bulb takes that cell suspension and puts it into this region of the, the uh, lab card. That's then sealed, and, and then uh, that goes into the analyzer. OK, so, so, that's, um, so, so, so we have a couple types of samples, uh, a cell suspension uh, for the oral cancer test. For the cardiac test, we can use serum. Uh, we can use serum saliva or an oral fluid 
sample. We, we've run a, a large trial on both of these fluids. Uh, we can use plasma and whole blood also. C Christy, back to you for the next question. Dr. Devitt, what is the cost of this instrument and is this instrument available worldwide? Christy, th 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 thanks again, and thanks to the audience for the, the second question. So, so uh, we are, Sensodex is, is now in the process of scaling the device uh, for strategic partners, and um, so, so that's our, our first uh, release is to the bioscience research market. And um, while that is happening, there is a, a parallel effort to take a number of the, the test into a, a regulated environment onto the pathway to, to the FDA. But, but we have a, a, a series of, um, a, a, a series of um, releases that are anticipated in the next uh, couple years. And at this particular um, moment, I, I'm... Um, not in a position to to uh, state uh, the exact cost of, of these instruments, but um, but it, it is uh, ten percent ish of the cost of larger uh, commercial instruments, and and um, again the, the the research market will uh, will be the first releases. Uh, Christina, or Christy, uh, back to you. Thanks, Dr. McDevitt. Now, does it require a PCR operation? So, for 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 a, a legonucleotide testing, uh, we've done a, a number of different things. Uh, we've done PCR, uh, continuous flow PCR um, on a chip to, to amplify uh, and then deliver that to uh, molecular beacons that does the detection at the back end of, of that. Um, so that uh, that area is not our number one focus right now, um, and so, so we have compatibility. We've published the data in, in this particular uh, space, but but we will be looking at uh, cell-based tests uh, in the oncology space, uh, the the cardiac area, um, and um, um, trauma. Uh, drugs of, of, of abuse. Th these are all areas that, that we published in. Uh, we, uh, but, but the uh, 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 DNA-based test would follow after that. Christine, or Christy, back to you. Thanks, Dr. McDevitt. We have time for maybe two more questions. So let's go with this question. What are the regulatory pathways to move these devices into the clinic? Uh, th 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 thanks again for that uh, follow-up question. So so the, the, the regulatory pathway, as you might imagine depends on the application area and one of the reasons that we are pushing out the bioscience research area first is we see a, a compelling need to to do this first and so we don't have a regulatory barrier but one of the things I, I did while I was in Houston as I served as the director of the Gulf Coast Consortium on Early Disease Detection and one of the interesting things about that 
uh, exercise is it paired us with over a hundred clinicians that had, um, in many cases, interesting biomarkers moving on the pathway to publication, but so few of them would move to that next level. And uh, the, the lack of uh, regulatory approval for uh, new biomarkers is, is stunning. It's, it's um, almost embarrassing for the scientific community. And, and part of the, the reason for this, and, and what came out of our study of this pathway, is that there's three steps. There's a discovery of, of a validation and a clinical implementation. And the discovery might, in the protein area, could be done with a mass spec. And the next step is, is to use an ELISA plate after you've harvested some antibodies. And then at the final clinical implementation, it's on a commercial analyzer or on a immunochromatographic strip. So, so three different instruments, three different steps, three different uh, groups, often three different sets of lawyers. Uh, and a lack of continuity, and people just don't like to deal with that. And so this issue of, uh, it's a great question about the regulatory pathway, and so we've thought a lot about this and, and about how do we create a highway? Um, how do we create a highway for biomarkers? To Not that this is going to go 60 miles an hour and initially, but how can we make that process more efficient because the people that are making these discoveries in many cases are not bioengineers. They're, they're bioscientists or clinicians understanding the biomarker piece. So, so we feel our most important contribution at the next stage is actually handing off this blue, bo blue box, which is behind me over, <laughs> over here, to, to individuals that, that um, are in the trenches and, and uh, uh, doing biomarker discovery. And, and, and so that, um, that particular process has the capacity to save $50 million in five years, which is basically what it took us to build that blue box. Um, but uh, to, to uh, prime the pump, so to, to speak, to make sure that this blue box has an FDA approval by the time uh, people have completed their their studies. We are are nucleating and and building uh, a series of uh, uh, in in the cardiac area. We're, we're going through a pathway of individual biomarkers with a 510k uh, pathway to get to get them uh, initially through the the process uh, with a gold standard that's uh, we would be substantially equivalent to. Um, and that's not a big regulatory uh, barrier. And, and then we would create the uh, combinations a a after that. Uh, the oral cancer is a little bit different. Um, and, and we are uh, anticipating a, a de novo 510K uh, pathway that uh, would, would, would take that, uh, that uh, test ultimately into a uh, chair-side uh, uh, point-of-care measurement. So, so um, Christy, back, back, back to you. That will have to be our last question as we are out of time. We want to thank you again, Dr. McDevitt, for your presentation. Do you have any final comments for our audience? Christy, th th thanks again for moderating this, this session. I'd also want to thank everyone uh, today for attending this lecture. Uh, I think you've just seen the, the, the poll results, which uh, is giving you a, a real-time sense of where people feel uh, the, um, this technology may have some uh, utility. I would be thrilled to death if we could establish new relationships. Uh, to help you uh, um, and uh, feel free to uh, contact me via email. There's been a, a couple 
uh, links that have been put put out and uh, love to correspond with uh, you going forward. Thank you so much. Thank you again, Dr. John McDevitt. Before we go, I want to let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through February 2017. And you will receive an email from LabRoots letting you know when this webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That's all for now. We thank you for joining us. We hope to see you again soon. Goodbye.